Here's what we're going to do today. Every week for the past 10 weeks, we've been going through the Mike Ferry 21 point sales system. Now we've typically been doing that on Wednesdays, but since Cindy's doing a class this Wednesday on the new RPA, we are going to do our Mike Ferry class today. So we've gone through the first 10 points of the Mike Ferry sales system. And now we're on to point 11, which is working with buyers. Okay, so we're gonna go through a couple of thoughts on how to efficiently work with buyers and just some general best practices, things along those lines. So I wanna start with this though. <clears throat> I understand listings are what we're after. That's the most ideal situation. But you have to shift mindset a little bit in terms, some people have to shift the mindset a little bit in terms of the buyer stuff. I understand, again, we're all after listings. That's the key. And buyers do take time and buyers can be a lot of energy and things along those lines. And we're gonna go talk about that a little bit. But the only way, the only way you'll ever be able to make any sort of money with buyers, have any sort of profit with buyers, or have any sort of ability to successfully navigate the buying process, you have to switch the mentality on how you feel about buyers. So here's what I mean. Has anyone ever heard the term buyers or liars? Right, anyone ever heard of that term? Yeah. Buyers are liars. Buyers are liars. Yeah, just buyers though, right? No one else. Real estate agents, not liars, ever. Incorrect. How could everybody be number one? Somebody's lying. <laughs> okay. Real estate agents lie. Do sellers always tell the truth? No, no, it's ridiculous to think they do. But we don't ever go, well, sellers are liars. No, but because the buyers are liars thing kind of rhymes, kind of has a little twist to it. That's right. <laughs> so, but our mindset, and we're going to get into a lot of other points here, but, but we have to start working with, in, in terms of work with buyers, is first of all, shift the mindset that when you get a buyer lead, it's not like, oh God, buyers are liars. La, 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 la. Buyers are not always liars. Sometimes they are, but people are liars sometimes. Some buyers just don't know specifically what's available or they don't know specifically what they want because they haven't seen it yet. Think about this. I want to buy a house, but I don't know real estate. I, I think I want a three bedroom, two bathroom house. If you ask a buyer, what kind of square footage do you want? What kind of layout do you want? I don't know. They could say a number of square footage, but they might not know what that looks like. So then you go show them the house. That's not what they want. Oh, they're liars. I didn't know any better. So if you're going to have that mentality right away of buyers or liars, and you're not going to switch that mentality, I want you to write this down. Refer out every single one of your buyers. If you can't switch the mentality that buyers are liars or buyers are awful, do yourself a favor, and I'm not saying, I'm saying this truthfully, not to be mean or joking or anything like that. I'm saving you time. I'm actually going to make you more money. Just because you won't close them, you'll get frustrated. It'll cost you more business instead of just referring them out to somebody else, getting a 25% referral fee. I'm telling you, if you can't get out of that mentality. Okay. Now, if you can get out of that mentality, we're still after listings, but buyers can be very profitable in some cases. And we have a lot of examples of people that make a decent amount of money with buyers if you work with them the right way. And we're going to go into that particular situation right now, some of the ideal tips and thoughts on working with buyers. But we, we needed to start with that because sometimes we have to get the mind in the right spot 
in terms of working with buyers. So I wrote down here next with buyers. They have a right to be stressed. They have a right to question everything. They have a right to second guess their decisions. Why do they have a right to do that? Well, I pissed off somebody. We lost someone. That was bound to happen. Why do buyers have a right to do all that? What's the main reason that they have a right to feel this way? Anybody? They're the ones they're spending the money. the money and they're the... Okay, they're, they're, they're putting in their money. The right. it's, it's their money. What else is it specifically about the money thing it's in terms of a buyer? It's you're you're right. They're putting in they're putting in the money. But what is what else? Typically, with most buyers, what is it also about the money thing? The amount of it. What is that? The amount of money. The amount of it, because it's probably all they have. So here's what I mean. Do most buyers are they putting down fifty thousand dollars and then they also have an additional fifty thousand dollars in the bank? Or are most buyers putting everything they have as their down payment? Everything they have as a down everything payment. Everything they have, right, everything they have. They're putting, and they've worked hard. Okay, let's be honest with ourselves. Is saving money easy? No, it's not. No, saving money's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy. It's expensive to live here. Whether you're a homeowner and you're Got trying to buy the next house or a first time buyer. It's hard to save money. So they've worked all this time. They're putting away every buck they can, $10 here, $1,000 here, putting away pennies here. They're doing everything they can to put away some money. They've worked hard for it. And now we're coming to them and saying, hey, all that money you've worked up for that you've put in a bank account, we're going to empty it. Oh, oh. <laughs> they have a right to be a little wary about it. So you have to understand the mindset of that particular situation. We're asking them to take all their hard-earned money and empty it out. So you have to accept the fact that they can ask questions, they can second guess everything, they can be nervous, they can be emotional. It's all their money. It's everything they have for the most part. Now, sometimes we think that the person who's a current homeowner moving up isn't that way because why because they have two hundred thousand dollars in equity they have two hundred thousand dollars in equity and they have five thousand dollars in the bank is most cases most people don't have two hundred thousand dollars in equity and another two hundred thousand in the bank we're like ah it's 200 grand so even a move up buyer their equity is probably all they have so you have to be able to be relate to that a little bit Okay. Okay. So let's go down here. A couple of next point I wrote down. Mike Ferry has two basic rules regarding buyers. Two basic rules regarding buyers. Rule number one 100% of all buyers should be pre qualified by a lender, no exceptions. 100% of all buyers should be pre qualified by a lender, no exceptions. Rule number two. You should pre-qualify the prospect for their motivation and the type of home they want to buy. Two basic rules of working with buyers. 100% of all buyers should be pre-qualified by a lender, no exceptions. Rule number two, you should then pre-qualify the buyer for their motivation and the type of home they want to buy. If it's a cash buyer, you get proof of funds, okay? Because they're not gonna get approved by a lender. I will never for the life of me figure out why people go show homes with a plural to buyers that don't have a pre-approval letter. I'll never figure that part out. I'll just never, I never will. Some of you will do it. I'll never figure it out. So here's the thing, or oh, it's a cash buyer and you don't have proof of funds. Oh, but Robert, they're a cash buyer. Had, has anyone here ever been in a situation where they had a cash buyer who didn't really have the cash. <laughs> okay. 
Are you going to finance it? I'm going to pay cash. Oh, yeah. I got a cash buyer. Hey, let's go see this house. Let's go see this house. Hey, you want to wrap an offer? Well, I don't have the cash yet. Uh, that's a problem. <laughs> that's, a, that's an issue. I, I, I ran into this before. I ran into this before because I didn't pre-qualify. I was so excited. I was a young lad in this business. I'm going to get cash. Yes, cash. Where's the money coming from? Oh, no, I, I'm sell I got some stuff I'm selling. Oh, okay, great. Go out, ready to go. Want to, want to write up an offer? Well, yes, as soon as I have the cash. Well, when, when are you getting the cash? Well, I got to sell some. I got to sell some stuff. When are you going to sell? I don't know. I haven't started that process yet. Okay. Thanks. That's good. Good start. I'm so glad we just spent like hours and <laughs> all this time and you don't even have it, haven't even started the process of selling the stuff. Some of you work with international buyers. It's not always easy to get the cash internationally. So sometimes they say, well, the money's coming from overseas. Okay. When's it going to be here? All right, so they have to be pre cash buyer. I need proof of funds. They're getting a loan. I need to be pre pre approved by a lender. Okay, right? they have to have these types of things. Now, aside from qualification purposes, right? What else does them getting pre approved show you? Aside from being qualified, what else does them going to get pre approved show you? they're ready that they're ready they're motivated because anybody can sit on their couch look at right now i could take a five minute break and say hey hold on a second go to any site and request a showing i haven't talked to a lender i haven't done that i could anybody could just sit on their computer from their phone or anything and request a showing that takes no motivation whatsoever to go do that the fact that they went and got pre-approved, or at least, I mean, maybe they didn't went and go get because you don't have to meet with the lender these days. They're motivated. They gave, they gave them the W-2s, the pay stubs, all those types of things. They have to be pre-approved. Have to do it. Okay. And then you need to pre-qualify the prospect for their motivation and the type of home they want to buy. I wrote down underneath this, just because they say they want to buy a home doesn't mean they're motivated to buy a home. A lot of people that want to buy, but in, in most of our markets, is it pretty competitive to buy a house? Yes. Yeah. So wanting to buy versus motivated to buy in a competitive market is two different things. So I wrote down here, the buyer needs to have a winning mentality. Because they're competing. It's a competition for the most part, unless they're in certain price ranges and things like that. They need to want to win. Well, I want to buy a house. Okay, great. How bad do you want a house? Do you want to win? You, know, you don't have to go into that and in the intensity, but like you have to have them. They have to be want, want to win to buy a house. I also wrote down here, they, in terms of pre-qualifying them, their motivation type of house they want to buy. As I wrote down here, they have to accept that they're not going to get a deal on the transaction. Anyone here ever run into a buyer that says they want a deal, looking for a deal? Yes. All right. So here's really important. I want everyone to write this down. If you ever run into a buyer that says, I want a deal, the next thing you should say is, what's a deal to you? What is a deal to you? Because the truth is, if somebody, if a buyer says they want a deal, what's the first thing that pops in your head? No money down, no money. Yeah, no money down, right? That, that could be a deal, right? What else? What's another idea? Buyer says I want a deal. What, below what, market value. Below market value. I want a house below market value, right? First thing that pops in their head. Does anyone here know anyone? that a deal to them is if they can just get them get somebody to pay down a buck not a house per se 
but they grind the person at the store. They grind the insurance agent because they're just trying to get a dollar. I know people like that. They feel like they got a deal. Well, how much are you going to charge to paint the house? 2000 bucks. Do it for 1750. You have a deal. And it was like, I got them down 250 bucks. Okay. But there are people that have that. So sometimes a buyer looking for a deal might just be looking for a little win. Well, what's a deal to you? Well, if I could buy a house and not have to overpay crazy for it, I would do it. Okay. If I could get a house at actual market price, I would do it. I don't want to pay overpriced. Okay. So you have to ask the question. Now, if they say, well, I want something 10% below market value, I would look at them and say, so do I. Now, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, can I be honest with you? Sure. If I find that house, I'm going to buy it. <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to give it to you. <laughs> I get paid 2% to give it to you, or I make 10% if I buy it myself. Hello. Why would I show you that house? Come on. It's okay to it's okay to have some fun with this. Hey, now Robert. Yes, Michael. Yeah. Also, you can tell them I got a deal for you. If you buy the house today, I guarantee you it's going to be about fifty thousand dollars lower than tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. You know, you show them the trends. Here's the deal. It might take you a little bit of time in some cases, but Michael's case, yeah, it'll be fifty thousand dollars more tomorrow. In some cases, it might be fifty thousand dollars over a couple of years. So what? You gonna be alive? Yep, good. All right, next point I wrote down here. You need to identify what differentiates you from your competition and be prepared to share this with the buyer. We always talk about what differentiates you as a listing agent. You need to identify what differentiates you as a buyer's agent. Otherwise, a buyer can go to any real estate agent. They can go online and just type in and see if someone can show them the house. What makes you different representing a buyer than representing uh, than another agent representing the buyer. You need to identify that. What I would write down is I would have three to four things that differentiate you from other buyer's agents and be able to articulate that to a buyer. Okay. We can go over that another time of some things that might differentiate you, but that can be one of the things. I'll, gi I'll give you an example of one. So this could be something. So Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, when I take a listing, do you want to know one of the things that drives me crazy? Sure. What's that? Is when I get a, a contract or an offer from a buyer's agent that's not complete or is messy or is missing signatures or is just doesn't have all the things filled out correctly. That drives me nuts. Do you think I want to work with that agent? No. That's one of the reasons why you want to work with me. Because when I submit an offer for you, it is going to be pristine. It is going to be perfect that when the listing agent sees it, they know they're working with a professional and more likely wanting to work with an agent like that. That can be an example of something that might differentiate yourself, but you have to do that. There was, a, there was an article in the Orange County Register. Now, this was four or five years ago. So the numbers might change, but you'll, you'll get the, the point. According to the Orange County Register, they said on average, somebody looking to buy a house has some contact with 10 real estate agents before they buy a house. <clears throat> Meaning they went to an open house, they went to a few open houses, which they got connected with a real estate agent. They were referred to a real estate agent. They got called by a real estate agent. But each buyer, on average, had some sort of connection, however big it may be, with 10 agents before they bought the house. You need to identify what differentiates you for the competition. You need to be able to articulate it, and you need to be able to get it out fast. <clears throat> I wrote down here next, as with a seller, develop a list of four or five standards that you're going to work with when working with a buyer and stick with them. As with a seller, develop a list of four or five standards that you're going to work with when working with a buyer and stick with them. 
So like a seller, for example, will be, I'm going to pre-qualify hundred percent of the time. <clears throat> I'm not going to take a commission below this. I'm only, I'm not going to take a uh, listing contract below this many days. You know, these can be different standards. Buyers, same thing. Could be, I'm not going to take out a buyer unless they've been pre, fully pre-approved. I'm not going to take out a buyer unless I've done a full prequal uh, buyer consultation with them. I'm not going to take out a buyer within a certain mile radius of my area. Could be a price point. <clears throat> I'm not taking out a buyer that's below this price point. <clears throat> but develop four or five standards and stick with them. One of the standards that some of you need to set is how many buyers you're working with at once. Let's see, let me see. I, I know he was at an appointment. Jack Ma, can you hear me? Yes, I am, but I'm talking with food in my mouth. Sorry. Okay. All right. All right. Well, then I'll, I'll get back to you when you're done. <clears throat> This is, I, I brought up Jack because this is something specifically that he's done, <clears throat> is he set a standard on how many buyers he's allowed to work with at once. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> so, so Jack, how many buyers are you allowed to work with at one particular time? No more than three, two, usually. Three is uh, if the third one is uh, a seller or it's uh, really close to the neighborhood. Okay, got it. So max of three, but more likely two, unless it's a seller who also needs to buy a property. And what is the benefit of that? Um, so because I limit the number of buyers, so I really pay more attention to them. I can really actually, I found an off-market opportunity the other day because I was prospecting a, a, a neighborhood that they, they missed out on a property. Um, cause you know, now I can focus more time in each individual buyer. That's one of, for one, that's something that just happened last week. Got it. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So for some of you, it has to be that it has to be limit the number of, that could be one of the standards is I'm only going to show this many buyers at once because at some point you just have so many buyers on the list. You can only really service so many buyers unless you're a 100% buyer's agent, like you're on a team or something like that. And even then there's limitations. <clears throat> Otherwise you're driving all over town, you're showing property. And when you're driving all over town, trying to show six or seven buyers property, what are you not doing? Parts what are you not doing if you're trying to drive all over town with six or seven buyers showing them property, writing up offers, all those things? Prospecting. No time to prospect. You're not prospecting. Thank you, Duke. I saw that in the chat box too. <clears throat> and if you're not prospecting, it's kind of hard to find sellers. So for some of you, it's you have to limit them. That's one of the standards. You have to limit the number of buyers that you can work with at one time. <clears throat> or as Jack said, you know, when you limit the number of buyers, you can focus more on those particular buyers and get them into a property faster. So you have to identify some standards. <clears throat> okay. I wrote down here next, tell the buyer before you start working with them, tell them the exact process that you're going to use before you show them property. Now we're not going to go over today, the consultation the, the, and an idea of a consultation. We'll do that another time, but have a process, tell them the process. Now here's the important key. If they don't want to do one of the steps of the process, move on. <clears throat> if they don't want to do one of the steps of the process, move on. So I'll give you an example. So one of the things we're going to do, Mr. and Mrs. Byers, I'm going to, we're going to go over what you want, the type of home you want to buy. And then uh, I'm going to show you three properties. Well, no, no, I don't, I don't want to do three properties. I, I want to see at least 10. No, we're not going to do that. And then we have an objection handler for that. But if they say, well, if you're only going to show me three properties, then I'll just go work with somebody else. That's when you say, have a, have a good time. If they don't want to do one such process. Okay, well, before we go show property, uh, we need to do a consultation. I don't want to do a consultation. I'm looking for a three bedroom, two bath, $600,000. I understand that. But, you know, part of the process for us to get a consultation, really figure out 
world more detail what you're looking for. No, 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 just find me a house. Move on. Figure out your process. And again, well, we could help you with that. We have different steps. If they don't want to do one of the steps of the process, move on. You have to maintain control. You have to maintain control. I wrote down here next, only show property when all the decision makers are present. Make sure on that point, you identify in your consultation who all the decision makers are. Not all the decision makers are just people that are going to live in the house. That's a key thing. Anyone ever run into a situation where the parents were a decision maker? We're, I got, I, I, we have a couple agents with that situation going on right now where I, I, I had a conversation with somebody the other day and they were, I was asking them about one of their leads and they said, yeah, I went and showed them property. They loved it. But then all of a sudden they said they had to show their dad. Dad came out. Yeah. Well, is the dad buying the property? Are they giving the down payment? No, they, they go to their dad for, for advice. So you need to identify, don't just say, oh, are you buying the house by yourself? Or is anyone else going on the loan with you? That's not always the case. There might be somebody else involved in the decision-making process. We've had people that are, I want my brother to see it. I want my parents to see it. I want my advisor to see it. And we hear this all the time. Make sure you identify who's involved in the decision-making process and don't show property until all the decision makers are present. Well, what if one of the decision makers is out of the area? Well, then you need to have a conversation with the buyer saying, how are they going to help you with this process if they can't even see the property? Or instead of showing you the property in person, would you rather just do a, a 3D tour of the property? We can get on Zoom. Okay. Let me ask you, what about when you constantly have a, uh, this actually recently just happened to me too. You, you're showing a property to a couple, but if one of the couple members can't be there, right? It's a weekend. It's a Saturday. Wife is free, but husband's got to work. She goes in, she sees the place. She loves it. Now she's got to go back and tell the husband, hey, look, we saw a great place in this and that. We want to write an offer. Well, I want to see it first. Oh, Jesus. Well, so, so you have, okay, great question. This happens all the time. So number one, you have to either figure out, look at, I understand you two have different work schedules. What time are you available together to go see properties? Thursdays from four to six. Great. Then let me schedule a couple showings Thursdays between four to six and show them what's available. Not everything might be available, but you do the best you can. If they don't have any time available to go see houses, it's the worst marriage in the history of the world. What do you mean you don't have time to go see homes? You never have any time together ever. <laughs> I mean, there's got to be something. Okay. Now, if it is one of those situations, though, where it's like, but sometimes this is what happens. They have to fail their own way first. Well, okay, I want my husband to see it. Okay, great. And then by the time you get the husband involved, that house is no longer showing property. That's when you go to them and say, do you, okay, now that you see what happens, if we don't get act quickly, we really need to make sure you're seeing the houses together. So sometimes they have to just fail their own way. That's not just them. That happens to a lot of people. But I would, I would really try to narrow it down. What time are you both available during the week to go see homes? And let's figure that out. There has to be a time. There's just no way they can be married, you know, or anything like that. Now, let's say it's a brother and sister, right? They're not, okay, Robert, they're not married. They're brother and sister. It's like, I would still argue that there's got to be some time throughout the week there's seven days a week. There's 24 hours in a day. I understand you're not showing property at two o'clock in the morning, but there's got to be some time where if there's multiple buyers, they can go see a house together. It just has to be. Now that could also be a standard though. I'm not saying it has to be because you could might, you might be able to make that deal work, but that could also be a standard of look, if there's multiple buyers and they can never go see the house at the same time together. And eh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to keep showing the same house three different times to a bunch of different people. 
That's a great question. We run into that all the time. Okay. So I wrote down here next, it's very common for buyers to buy the same type of house over and over again. It's very common for buyers to buy the same type of house over and over again. So make sure they describe their present home and don't be, don't be surprised if they buy the same type of home again. Now, when you ask them to describe their present home, assuming that they're currently a homeowner, if it's a first time buyer, they're probably not gonna run into this. But if they have them describe their present home and figure out what is it that you like about your current home, what is it you don't like about your current home? Because a lot of people buy the same type of home. It might be a little bit bigger square footage, but they typically don't go a whole different structure, whole different layout. It's very uncommon for people to do that. So make sure you have a good idea of their present home when you're looking for a new home. All right, only show three homes at a time, max. And then ask them to buy one of them. Based on the three homes we've seen today, which one would you like to put an offer in on? Don't show them more than three homes. Let's do a be honest. You don't have to answer, but do a be honest with yourself. If we went and saw six homes, could you very detailed describe all six homes to me at the end of that? Probably not. And we do this for a living. So if you take a buyer out and you show them six homes and go, all right, which ones were your favorite? I don't really remember number one. I don't got much of number two. I vaguely remember number three. Okay, so the first three homes, which took 30 minutes to an hour, were useless. Three homes max. I wrote down here, this is really important. This is really important. You can't use distance as an excuse to show more than three homes. I run into this sometimes. Well, I'm not going to drive an hour and only show them three homes. Then refer the deal. Then refer the deal. I'm not driving all the way out there and only going to show three homes and come back. Then refer the deal. Distance is not an excuse to do poor, poor job as a real estate agent. <clears throat> Keep in mind the more properties you show, typically the lower confidence they have in you. The more properties you show, typically the lower confidence they have in you. Because they came to you, they did a consultation to describe exactly what they were looking for in their price range. You gave them all the reasons why they should work with you. And now you're showing them 10, 15, 20 homes, most of which they don't like because it doesn't fit their description. Their confidence in you starts going down. Sometimes we think the opposite. Well, I'm going to show them a bunch of homes so they can show I know the market. I'm showing them this. You know, they're going to like everything. It's usually the opposite. Okay. Imagine yourself. Imagine yourself being in a situation <clears throat> where you go, you're, a, uh, you're testing cake, which sounds like a great job. You're testing cake and you tell them, all right, here's what I love. I love just, you know, chocolate cake, vanilla frosting chocolate cake. Give me something in that variation. Okay, where well, here's a white chocolate with a caramel cake. It's not, it's not what I wanted, but okay, it's kind of neat. Okay, now here's strawberry cake with pineapple frosting. Okay, this is, this is not what I wanted. Well, they're showing you their whole cake selection. And, but you, now you're getting frustrated despite the fact you have all this wonderful cake in front of you because you told them, I just want chocolate cake with vanilla frosting. So the more you show them that doesn't fit what they want, we think we're showing them all these properties. It's actually frustrating them. And it actually loses their faith that you're listening to them. <clears throat> the goal of a, of a buyer consultation, for example, and to get with a client is to get them from 100 available homes to five. Meaning that what do buyers do? I'm looking for a three bedroom house, three bedroom, two bathroom house, up to 750,000, anywhere in these five cities. Okay, and then you go to the MLS, three bedrooms, two bathrooms, 600, 750,000, these five cities, and you come up with 80, 80 available listings. <clears throat> 
you can't show them 80 homes. You only want to show them 20. So you need to ask questions to narrow that down to 10. Here's a great question to ask somebody. Everyone should write this down. All three of you should write this down. But buyer says, I'm looking in this city, this city, this city, this city, this city. Here's what you do. <clears throat> I'm looking in, I'm willing to look in Irvine, Fountain Valley, Santa Ana. Okay, great. So let me ask you this. If each of those cities had the same exact house for the same exact price, which one would you choose? <clears throat> well, I would choose the one in Irvine. Okay, great. I just figured out top city is. So now I'm just going to go focus on Irvine first. Let's find the house in Irvine because if all was equal, you would choose Irvine. So let's go see if we can find the house you want in Irvine first. Robert. Yes. Yeah. I just want to ask you now, going back to today's uh, condition of the market, uh, we wish there are a hundred properties or whatever, but let's say in today's market, you are lucky that you find three or four and of course we show them, would you recommend, because that's what we're doing, because we got to put that in some people's mind to make, you know, let's say that we show four properties and they said, you know, and instead of making one offer to make more than one offer on properties, because, you know, the chances to get one house sometimes is slim. Yeah. So is that okay to ask? Well, yeah, I, I would have them write as many offers as they want. So to, to Michael's point, you know, instead of the old rule was, you know, which one do you want to write an offer on? could say, how many of these do you want to write offers on? Which ones do you want to write offers on? Because we might not get this one, but so let's write them on both. And if you win both, God bless you. You have a choice. No, absolutely. hundred percent. Good point. Good point. On that point, I wrote down here next. If there's nothing available that fits what they're looking for, don't go show them property. That's kind of like what they're looking for just be honest, go to them and say, there's nothing specifically of what they're looking for. So we have a couple options. One, these homes are in the city you want in the price range they want, but instead of this, they have this. And so instead of 2000 square feet, they only go up to 1600. Is that okay? Option two would be, we could go to a different city or maybe a different area in that city that has all the descriptions you're looking for. It's just in a different area. <clears throat> or option three is that we can see, is there any way you can go to a different price point to get what you're, the type of home you're looking for? but don't show them property. It's like, well, they asked for this. This one's kind of close. Let me just show them this. Don't do that. Don't do that. All right, last couple points here. We talked about this earlier. Don't hesitate. If you get too busy, don't hesitate to refer your non-great buyers to other agents for referral fees. Don't, don't hesitate to refer buyers and get referral fees. Okay. And then the last thing I wrote down here is this in terms of, of working with buyers. I mean, I, there's pages and pages of stuff with buyers, but this is the last one I'll, I'll write for the day. It's one-on-one already. <clears throat> Despite the convenience of it, try not to, if you're dealing with a motivated buyer, try not to put them on an automatic email campaign. See, sometimes what we do is we put them in the MLS, right? We set them up on the automatic emails. If something comes up, you'll get the email. Let me explain to you very quickly why I would not do that, okay? Number one is this. You have to get them out of the house. By setting them up on an automatic email, this is what happens. So first of all, when you get emails outside of work, are you typically on your computer or on your phone? Where do you typically read your emails outside of work? Email on your computer or on your phone? Oh. Your phone. So I have this little device. 
that I'm getting my emails, you're sending me property. So, and I'm typically on my phone. When I'm on my phone reading emails, what am I typically doing? I'm multitasking. Okay. Because very rarely do people sit down and just focus on the TV. It's I'm watching TV, I'm watching the game, but I'm also playing on my phone. So I'm going through my emails as I'm watching the game. Oh, there's an email from Robert. So one, I have to hope that they read the email. Two, I have to hope that they stop focusing on the game and they go down and say, Phew, because now they've said, I got to look at these properties. So I have to hope that they read it. I have to hope that they focused. And then I have to hope that this little device gives the property justice in terms of its pictures and all these other different things. So that they'll say, oh, reply, I want to go see this one. That's a lot of hope. More than likely, they're going to scan through and go, oh, I don't like that. Okay, and then they're going to move on. I have to get them out of the house. I have to get them to go see the house. Okay, because the pictures don't always do it justice. The description doesn't always do it justice. There's a lot of really bad agents out there. We've all seen the photo of a listing where you can actually see the reflection in the mirror of the agent taking the photo with their phone. We've seen that, okay? Every single one of us has. And if I'm a buyer, I'm looking at a $700,000 property and that picture comes up. So I lost the list. I lost the chance for them to see this great house because all I did was put them on an email campaign. I have to get them out of the house. I found some homes for you to see. Let's go see them. Can you email them to me? I don't want to do that. I don't want your first impression of the house to be the terrible photos. I want your first impression of the house to be it in person. I'm telling you, blind faith, this will work. Okay. So get them out of the house. Here's the other reason I don't like the automatic emails. This is just me. I never want, I never want to be in a position where the client knows more than I do. If I'm busy in the morning, the client gets the email instantly of this new listing. I'm busy doing something. They get the email. They call me and they say, hey, thanks for the email. Can you tell me a little bit more about 123 Main Street? And I'm going, um, what? Because I don't know 123 Main Street's listed because I'm busy and the client got it instantly. So now they're calling me and they know more than I do. I never want to be in that position. So I have to go, ah, uh, you know what? Let me look it up and get back to you. And they're going, the hell, you just emailed it to me. I just got it. How did I get it? And you don't have it. I don't want to be in that position. That's me. So I would always avoid on a motivated client, do it. Now, if they're not seriously motivated, they're kind of looky loose, just put them on whatever you want. But for the motivated people, I want to be in control. I'm going to do the searches. I'm going to send you the property specifically, or I'm going to text it to you. When can you go see it? I'm going to be in control of the situation. That's just a thought. Questions on anything we went over today? All right, good. All right, so hopefully there was one or two. Like I said, we got pages and pages of stuff of, of working with buyers. We used to do a lot of different classes on that. Yes. Robert, I know probably we covered this before, but this is happening, you know, and I know your position on how we can do this, you know, especially when you work against buyers, they're trying to buy with Redfin and they say, well, Redfin is giving me, if I buy with them, I think what's $1,000 or $1,500 back. That is happening a lot, especially for the Redfin. Right. What would be a good strategy to get back at them? I mean, or whatever we use on that, in that situation. Okay, well, Mr. Mr. Buyer, I appreciate that. Redfin will give you a little bit of money back if you work with them. Now, there's one, one big caveat to that. Oh, what's that? Well, you have to get your offer accepted and you have to close escrow in order to get your $1,000. Now, here's the thing. Even if you did get your offer and you go through inspections and all these other different things, All Redfin cares about is they want to get your deal closed, right? Right. They're, they're working. They don't work on referrals. They don't work on commissions. They're salaried agents. They just want to get your deal closed and move on, right? I want you as a client, which means I'm going to negotiate for you. Now, here's the deal. When it comes to an inspection, 
I'm going to save you a hell of a lot more than a thousand dollars. So you think you're getting a thousand dollars back? It might cost you ten thousand because they're not looking out for your best interest. They might not know the contracts as well as I do. A thousand dollars is nothing compared to what you might be losing. I would try to go that route. No, that's and, great, uh, and especially and if, the agent, the agent for uh, Redfin. They are just employees. They are not even right. working at. They're, like they're just employees. They they they're just employees. They get a call from Redfin. This person wants to go see a house. Go show it to them. They might not be the most local expert. They might not be previewing property. They might not be the best with contracts. They're just going to show you the house, sell you the house, and move on to the next person they have to go show a house to. Do you want that person working with you, negotiating with you, or do you want someone whose whole well-being is knowing this area, having clients, work great service for them so that they can be a client for life and get their referrals? Which one do you prefer? Well, I want the other one. Great. For a thousand bucks, you're buying a house for six hundred thousand dollars, and you're concerned about getting a thousand bucks back instead of working with a local, strong professional agent. Not selling pens. This is a house. You're going to have appraisals, inspections, stuff that's going to cost thousands of dollars. I mean, man, there's the old quote. I, I don't know who came up with this, but it's if you think it's expensive to hire a professional, wait until you hire an amateur. I don't know who came up with that quote. I'll have to find it. But if you think it's expensive to hire a professional, wait until you hire an amateur. Then it's really expensive. Bravo. Yeah, I, I don't know who came up with that. Whoever came up with that one, good for you. Good question.